Hey everybody, Vermont Prepper here. It's Friday night here, March 1st, 2019. And I got to thinking with the recent summit between Kim Jong-un and President Trump regarding denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, I started rethinking my preps for nuclear war. And while I think the threat of nuclear war between governments is way down in the list of uh, possible SHTF scenarios, I do believe that the threat of a terrorist base event such as a dirty bomb is possible. You know, while an event would produce uh, minimal casualties like a dirty bomb as compared to a first world country nuclear war, it, it would it, or it could result in widespread panic, maybe some eco economic uh, problems uh, in a worst case scenario, a collapse. Or uh, civil unrest. You know, people will be worried. And they they uh, are going to do desperate things. Desperate people do desperate things. Uh, and it's unfortunate. But that's the world we live in. I actually took a course called The Threat of Nuclear Terrorism from Stanford University. And it's free. Uh, if you ever want to go through it, it's it's not bad. I, I got my certificate. You didn't have to get it, go through and get a certificate. You kind of got to get a decent grade to get one. But the knowledge was uh, sort of invaluable to me. And the thing that struck me the most was the possible methods of delivery of a, say, a dirty bomb, particularly from a freight in international waters. So a low-yield nuke could be launched from one of these freighters and, you know, offshore, the U.S. wouldn't have any means to uh, detect it if it's in international waters, if they're not around. And it could be either detonated in the atmosphere and give us a localized EMP effect if it's maybe 20, 30 kilometers above the Earth. Or if it's closer, maybe um, less than a mile or so. It's That's going to be what's going what's gonna to create the... Uh, fallout and destruction. So we're going to discuss today what happens in that second scenario where there's destruction and fallout. And I got to admit, until recent, I thought it was futile to really prep for nuclear war, particularly if it's between governments. I see, you know, some uh, benefit in prepping for possible dirty bomb but between governments I thought the threat is really really low and the reason why I didn't even feel like prepping for it was I just thought hey if it comes you know we're all going to be in uh, uh, a deep a deep deep problems and probably unsurvivable but uh I started reading up a little bit more and I found some great resources that I'm going to share in a description and it's going to show you that unless you're within a few miles of ground zero and this is this goes for uh, either dirty bomb or say a five kiloton or 500 kiloton uh, nuclear bomb from a, a like Russia or whatever uh, you could survive it. It's going to be problems, but you, you could survive it with uh, the right response. And most of the information I'm going to share is from uh, KI4U, the number 4U.com. And it's the only company in the U.S. that can calibrate nuclear radiation devices like you see in front of you. And a lot of these, I've just obtained them on eBay after reading about this because you can get them pretty cheap. And uh, this particular company, uh, it's the only company in the U.S. that can calibrate nuclear radiation detection devices. And the person who runs this site actually has old government calibrators with cesium radiation sources to calibrate uh, the devices and many of which you can get in pretty good shape. I got mine. I mean, they're all like basically brand new, you know, a couple, uh, you know, a little bit off on the paint on some of them, but I mean, they, they seem to work and they calibrate 
they're, they're not calibrated, but they run through the uh, self-tests uh, fairly good. So uh, they came in a box with instructions. And I got them, I'd say, all of these for under $200. So I'm going to go over all of them as we uh, move on in the video. But uh, I just want to show you the first one on the left here is called a dosimeter. And actually, it's this pen right here. The thing next to it is the charger. So what you do with this charger is you zero out the dosimeter, and then you put this dosimeter, say, on your belt, and you go about your day, and if it shows you the amount of uh, radiation that you're exposed. This one is the one you see in the movies. This is the uh, low-level radiation detector, and you can see here... The, this is the thing where you, you have the, uh, it looks like a microphone right here. You take that off and you can put it like on food or, you know, in, in water, you know, water to see if there's radiation fallout, et cetera. But it's really low level. These two right here, they're a little bit different and I'll go over why. But these are high level radiation detectors. This is if there's a, a big nuke that was dropped. And it's going to tell you if it's even safe to go outside. So those are the ones that you really want. Uh, a lot of people focus on these, which that's not going to tell you if it's safe to go outside. That's only going to tell you if your food is exposed to radiation. These will tell you if it's safe to go outside. And I'll go over uh, the differences on why that is. So one of the articles I read on this KI4U.com is called believe it or not, the good news about nuclear destruction. And I'm going to try and summarize the most important points. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to give you the links. They ask, what possible good news could there ever be about nuclear destruction coming to America, whether it's dirty bombs, uh, terrorist nukes, or ICBMs? And the thing that they say is that it's survivable for most people if they know what to do. And... The thinking is, is that most Americans have been jaded sort of by the myths of nuclear unsurvivability. And I, and I got to admit, I was one of them. I thought, well, you know, if you're going to get hit by a nuke in Russia, by Russia, one of those megaton or mega kiloton uh, nuclear bombs, you're finished. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, ground zero, granted, but even outside of ground zero, I thought... You're finished. It doesn't matter. Most people think that if nukes go off, everyone's going to die. And since the uh, end of the Cold War in the 80s, most Americans saw neither a need to prepare uh, for nuclear uh, war. And again, like I said, they wouldn't they didn't think it was it would do any good. And the biggest surprise, I think, for me was from the first flash of a nuke, most likely, you know, if you're outside of ground zero, and we'll go over that, what is what what is ground zero, is that you're going to still be here. And you might not be equipped to survive for long if you don't know what to do and what not to do. And this includes knowing what to do when you first see that initial flash. You know, and what, what I'm going to say is like an example, like for instance, many could survive the delayed blast wave uh, if you just did a plain old duck and cover, right? And that's pretty good news according to this article. You know, I, I guess if you duck and cover, you don't go and, you know, Americans are very, uh, very curious and they'll go out toward a window if they see a flash you're going to go out to a window and you're going to see, and that's the worst thing you could do because you're going to get shards of glass from the blast from the blast wave. The best thing you can do is duck and cover, you know, and and then the other thing is like let's say you survive that, and even fewer people know how to survive the radioactive fallout, which can kill many more people than the actual blast. But even then. If you know what to do, there's still more good news possible 
Um, 90% of those casualties, according to this article, could be avoidable. And again, simple measures taken after the detonation uh, can prevent, you know, death and or industry, injury uh, from exposure. And let's go through some examples. So example of a terroristic uh, nuke in D.C. So there was a study in 2004 uh, by DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and they examined the effects of a nuke detonated in Washington, D.C. What they discovered was that a 10-ton kiloton nuke, which is about two-thirds the size of Hiroshima, uh, if it's detonated at ground level, it's going to result in about 15,000 immediate deaths. And then you're going to have another 15,000 casualties from the blast and the initial radiation release. And this is pretty bad. And that's even without sort of the duck and cover mentality or the training. Um, the surprising, I guess, revelation to me is that over 99% of the residents in D.C. would have just witnessed and survived their first nuclear explosion. And the good news, again, if there is good news, is that most people would survive that initial blast. And again, this whole concept of duck and cover, which was very, very prevalent during World War II in the schools, uh, you know, air raid drills, etc. Uh, it's a simple and effective procedure to save yourself against the blast. And it, it goes on this article to talk about like uh, this book called, it's, it was written in 1946, Hiroshima, that one policeman actually went to Nagasaki to teach the police about ducking after atomic flash. And as a result, not a single policeman in Nagasaki died in the initial blast. But the population, unfortunately, wasn't so lucky to get notified about this kind of uh, training or this kind of procedure. And a lot of them died while they were out looking at the skies uh, at the source of that uh, big, brilliant flash. Now, this 2004, getting back to this 2004 DHS study, it also determined that as many as 250,000 people could be at risk from lethal doses of radiation from the fallout drifting downwards toward them after the blast. But again, they call it the good news. The good news here is that uh, these much larger casualties numbers from uh, radioactive fallout are avoidable also. And again, it only applies to those that were trained in like a civil defense type program in what they need to do. So now let's take a uh, modern nuke attack. So, and, you know, terrorist nukes, they'd likely be smaller than the Hiroshima bomb. And the Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. In a modern conflict, the nukes would be a lot larger, most likely in the 100 to 500 kiloton range. And in this particular scenario, the unsurvivable ground zero zone of a 500 kiloton airburst, it would extend out to 2.2 miles. So if you're within 2.2 miles of ground zero, uh, you're toast, you're finished. Uh, and the blast would arrive about eight seconds outside of that 2.2 mile marker. So you got eight seconds to duck and cover from that initial, that initial, uh, flash. Now it's going to continue to cause death or injury out to about nine miles so in statistics, this actually means that up to 15 times more casualties can occur between 2.2 .2 
and nine miles from ground zero. And again, the, the strategy of the duck and cover can significantly reduce the casualties from the initial blast. And I, you know, I'm not stupid. I realize that sounds overly simplified, right? Um, again, people are curious. They want to look at the source of the flash. And by the way, this the, the flash itself can actually blind you. Uh, it's like looking at the sun at close range. And I think, and I, I haven't done any of this kind of training, so I'd probably look at the freaking flash as well, but um, you really have to do the training. You have to say, okay, let's actually do a drill. And I really think that that's the only way, because again, you only have eight seconds, just think about that, on a, of a 500 kiloton blast to get to an inner corridor or to a lower level to, to duck and cover, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you definitely want, don't want to be looking out the window. All right, so now that you uh, survived the blast, what, what's next? So first thing, I think, is you don't attempt to out, outrun that downwind draft of the fallout. Uh, the roads are most likely going to be clogged with debris, and you don't know uh, the prevailing winds for the fallout. So sheltering, sheltering uh, in place is probably the better option. Uh, and some more statistics, uh, radioactive fallout actually loses 90% of its lethal intensity in the first seven hours and 99% in the first two days. So for those require, requiring uh, shelter from the fallout, the majority would only need two or three days of full-time sequestration uh, not weeks, as you see in the movie, like, uh, what was it, Cloverfield Lane or whatever it was, or some of those other nuclear war movies. So, again, more good news as an effective uh, fallout shelter. You know, you can easily improvise that at home. And again, some of these links that I'm going to sh show you uh, actually go through some of the methods. I'm not going to go through it in this video. It'll take way too long. Another article I read is uh, what to do if nuclear disaster is imminent. And, you know, again, what kind of shelter do I need to survive a fallout? You know, not everybody can afford a bunker. Most people can't. Um, but according to this article, which I tend to believe, I got to admit, uh, a bunker is really not necessary to survive. And to understand why, I want to discuss some of the principles of radiation protection to kind of dispel the myths and help you realize that it's survivable. Um, radioactive fallout is actually a particular matter. It's like a dust. And it's produced by a nuclear explosion, and it's carried high up into the air by the mushroom cloud, and it drifts on the wind. Like you, like you probably have heard. And most of it settles back down to the earth after the explosion. And the heaviest, most dangerous, and most notable fall, fallout, uh, the noticeable one, is typically like a dark grit. And it's going to fall out first closer to ground zero. And, you know, maybe depending on how close, it might be arriving minutes after an explosion. And... The smaller and lighter dust particles, they're going to be arriving hours later. And they drift much, much further downwind and often like hundreds of miles. So once it begins to arrive, whether it's visible or not, all of that will fall probably within an hour. And it'll coat everything uh, just like dust does on the ground and the roofs. However, if it's raining, it can concentrate the fallout to localize hot spots of much more intense radiation, and you wouldn't have any kind of visible indication of it, especially in the rain. So it's particularly dangerous. And the radioactive fallout 
dust is dangerous because it's emitting uh, penetrating radiation and it's similar to like an x-ray and this radiation uh, not the dust but the the radiation that the dust emits that can go through walls roofs windows and clothing so even if you manage not to inhale or ingest the dust and you manage to keep it off your skin hair clothes and none of it gets inside of your house, the radiation penetrating your home is still extremely dangerous and it can injure or kill you inside if you don't have the right shelter. So radioactive fallout from like a nuclear explosion, though it's dangerous initially, again, it loses its intensity quickly because it gives, like, gives off so much energy. Like, for example, like falling... Fallout emitting uh, gamma radiation at a mi at a rate of only of over and again 500 rontgens per hour. Uh, it's fatal with one hour exposure at for 50 percent. Uh, after the explosion, it weakens to one tenth as strong seven hours later, and two days later it's at like a hundred. Of, uh, as strong so it's it's again if you had to have good news it's good news because the families can readily survive if you're in a proper shelter and safely waited out so the goals of your family uh, are to maximize the distance away from the fallout dusting outside of the ground roof and trees and you want to maximize the mass between your family and the fallout outside to absorb the deadly radiation and then you want to make the shelter tolerable to stay in while the radiation subsides with every passing hour and I got some more stats here so again and this is all in the article but the thickness in inches needed to cut radiation down to only one-tenth of its initial intensity for different common materials is Steel, 3.3 inches. Uh, concrete, 11 inches. Earth, 16 inches. Water, 24 inches. Wood, 38 inches. The thickness to stop 99% of the radiation is 5 inches of steel, 16 inches of brick, 2 feet of packed earth, or 3 feet if it's loose, and 3 feet of water. All right, so a fallout shelter can really be built anywhere, and you should probably, you know, look at your best options, which are probably at home or nearby. You know, many structures already provide significant shielding or partial shielding that can be enhanced. If you don't have, let, let's say a basement's probably pretty good. Uh, if you don't have a basement, though, you'll just need to add more mass to achieve the same level of shielding. And you might want to consider like uh, solid structures nearby, especially those with like below ground spaces. And you think about commercial buildings, schools, churches, below ground parking garages, large and long culverts, tunnels, etc. But buildings with half a dozen or more floors where there's not a concern of blast damage. Uh, they might also provide a good radiation protection in the center uh, of the middle floors. And that's because both the distance and the shielding of the multiple floors provide uh, protection from the fallout on the ground and the roof. So bottom line, you know, choose a structure nearby with both the greatest mass and distance already in place between the outside. And that, you know, the outside's where the fallout's going to settle. So that's, a, that's, that's just a little advice there. So how do you know when it's safe to venture out? And now here's where we're going to go through some of, the, uh, some of the things, some of the preps that I have, right? And it's not going to be, um, you know, provide total protection, but it'll give you a good idea of, of you know, what you need to do uh, when a radiation actually um, sort of dissipates. And the first thing... Again, this is dosimeter, and all of these 
meters, the low level, the high level, they measure in ronchins. And a ronchin was, uh, that, that particular term was uh, based on Wilhelm Conrad Ronchin, and he won a Nobel Prize for discovering uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation in 1901. So uh, that's why these things are measured in ronchins. And you notice that this one is measured in milli ronchins per hour. And again, this is the low level radiation uh, detector, the ones that you see in the movies. And this is the high level. This will actually measure ronchins per hour. So this, this isn't going to measure the radiation like, you know, if you're trying to figure out if you're food safe or not. This is going to be the one that tells you it's okay to go outside. So now to give you a little perspective, 20 micro ronchins is safe per hour. Is safe is safe. Okay, one ronchin is a hundred times a hundred thousand times the average radiation of a major city. Five hundred ronchins is fatal in five hours. So if you look at the scales here, um, you see zero. This is measured that's one, two, three, four, five. If you move this scale here to times one hundred, if you're at the five, when this scale is at 100, you're gonna be dead in five hours, okay? So that's what it looks like. This one right here, um, you measure in micro -ronchin. So, So basically, again, the scale is the same. So if you put it times 10, the uh, scale would be, if it's 0 0.1, it's gonna be one, right? If it's times 100, you just move the decimal over two times, and the point one would be actually 10 micro ronchins per hour. So, again, you can go up to point two on the scale when it's times 100, and you still be pretty safe. All right, this dosimeter right here, that's this. This is the dosimeter. This basically, and this is a charger right here. So basically, you put this dosimeter, you, there's a little, and you're not going to be able to see inside here, but there's a scale from uh, 0 to 200. And you want to zero it out. And what you zero it out by putting it on this charger, you kind of just see this, this uh, little thing right here, this little... Um, protrusion there you put it in here on top of there and you kind of press down and then you adjust this particular meter to zero it out and it's kind of very very tricky to do it uh, these things are not easy to zero out I was actually able to zero this out but again I don't know if this is calibrated properly this charger uh, again, I'm going to send it out to that KI4U. They cost and it, it cost probably about 90 bucks to to get it calibrated, according to uh, some information I saw. This one right here, this is the one you see in the movies that they're walking around in the field, which you know is kind of unrealistic uh, because really this is for low level radiation. And this right here looks like a microphone. It's closed right now. You see those vents. If you open it, let's see. If you open it, you see this. It's called a Geiger Muller, like Robert Muller, right? And this is the actual detector of radiation. So this has a self detection, a little bit of radiation here and I turned it on and I have this open and you're gonna see right here we're zeroed out and on the side this little plate right here that's like a little source of radiation so I'm gonna put this against that and you'll see this move right so here we go and it's got to warm up a little bit and you'll see it uh, move 
back and forth. I'm not going to stay on this too long, but uh, basically this source will go between, uh, I have it on the 10, right? So that would be 1.5 to 2.5. And you have headphones right here and you probably, you might be able to hear it if I, uh, this is where you hear the, the static, right? And let's see if you can get the static. Hopefully you can hear that. All right, so you hear that in your headphones. And they make speakers for this thing instead of the headphones as well, where you can just put a speaker on top of right here. It'll screw on, and I actually ordered one so that you can, you don't even need to use the headphones now. And it looks just like it. They paint it, and they see, it's this nice CNC. It says you know, civil defense, etc. This one right here, this is the model for a high level radiation. And they recommend that you have at least one high level radiation detector because that's the one that is going to uh, help you decide if it's ready to go outside uh, if you're in the shelter and this one hasn't been calibrated since uh, 1983 you see that January January 7th 1983 so it needs calibration and this one um, you know you zero it out you can zero it does work you can zero it out right here that's what you do with this knob right here and then from there you check your uh, radiation and luckily this thing is not indicating anything, so we're pretty safe. All right, now this one is a little bit different. Uh, this one is a model CDV715. This one is a model CDV717. And the difference between the two, the, the, the uh, scales are the same. They're measured in rontgens per hour. Um, try to do this with one hand here. This one, if you could see that cable there, this cable is a 25 foot cable that you can connect right to there. And the other side goes right to here. So if you're in your shelter, you can have this particular, particular, uh, meter outside and it's called a survey meter. Uh, these two are survey meters. This one can partic this particular one, the 717, can be put outside so that you don't need to be outside to uh, to tell you where the uh, if it's safe to go out. So you would have the meter right here, and you'd hold it, and then this was to be the part that actually goes outside all right so uh, then you can see on the scale if it's safe or not right this is the one where and it's called a Geiger counter all right so this is a dosimeter and this one you know you would wear on your belt and throughout the day you'll be working and you can see if there's any difference throughout the day if you're getting low levels of radiation uh, or exposure that's unsafe this Geiger counter is the same kind of thing where you can, uh, you know, sort of put this like over your food or whatever and see if it's safe or over water. Uh, and this one is the one that you use when you're in shelter. And I recommend that everyone to get the 717 instead of the 715 because of the extension. All right, so now here's some of the other things that I have. And these are going to help. They're not going to like totally prevent radiation, but it's going to help. These are uh, chemical suits right here. Now you got your your top with a hood, uh, trousers, and you have gloves. And you'd want to duct tape all of the seams. And then I have my 3M 6800 mask. And this can be used for either pandemic or nuclear uh, fallout. And then I have my... Uh, uh, 60923, that's the uh, P100 uh, organic vapor acid cartridge. 
And according to the website on 3M, uh, this will protect against radiation dust. It's not going to protect against the, the radiation that the dust emits, but it will prevent you from inhaling the dust. These are kind of pre-filters for that. Um, I don't know how much they're going to help against radiation dust, but it'll certainly help against pandemics. And then these are two different, um, two different um, water filters. One is uh, called the New Door, and the other one is the Seychelles. And they each have, uh, will filter out radiation uh, from the water, 99% of it at least. So at least you'd have safe drinking water, say if you had some fallout uh, from the radiation. And then here, right here, you have the Iosat pills, and this again will protect your thy thyroid from radiation exposure. So I believe the adults take like one or two of these a day. And I have a bunch of these things. Um, so they're always good to have on hand. And I know they were pretty uh, hard to get, you know, when, when the Korean, uh, when, the, when it was uh, really bad with Korea, like about a year or two ago. So uh, you should stock up on these too. Anyway, I know this was a long video, and I appreciate if you guys made it through. Um, I hope you learned a lot and were informed, and um, maybe this will help you uh, decide if you want to actually prep for radiation. I think you could do it relatively cheap, uh, probably 500 or less, to get decent protection and monitoring. So uh, again, like, subscribe, comment. If I said anything wrong, I'm not an expert, you know, just let me know. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone for watching. Vermont Prepper out. And as always, keep prepping.